Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Schwab Coaching for our Wednesday edition of Trader Talk in today's market. I'm your host, Kevin Horner. Beautiful morning here in Denver, Colorado today. As usual on Wednesdays, I'm joined by my friend and Schwab coach, Brent Moores. Good morning, Brent. How are things out there in Utah? Uh, things are great in Utah here. We're supposed to hit 70 degrees today, Kevin, and uh, it's uh, the warmest day of the year. We have that for the next couple of days, and then another storm comes in, I think. But uh, that's glad we're going to enjoy it while we got it. Yeah, it sounds awfully familiar. Today is supposed to be our first 70 degree day of the year as well. I mean, uh, I actually learned this just yesterday. It's the latest we have gone into the calendar without having a 70 degree day in Denver, which is a, a little bit of a stretch for us. So I'm looking forward to finding those 70 degrees uh, yeah. days once more. Um, we, of course, have got uh, a bit of a different market the last day and a half. We'll take a look at that with all yeah. of you today. So I'm excited to get to maybe some changes in the market. But as always, we're going to review a number of those details with all of you, everybody. So thanks for being here. Some reminders uh, we do have this morning uh, in chat. We've got uh, Ben Watson with us. So uh, make sure you're engaging with Ben. He'll be there to answer and pick up the slack for us if we are missing your comments and questions. But feel free to post in the chat chat for the duration of our segment. Uh, we also would love to have a follow from you on X. If you're uh, engaging with us there, you can do so for us at Kevin Horner CS, at Brent Moore CS, and at Ben Watson CS. That would be helpful. And in a moment, I'm going to show you the coaching page here on YouTube to make sure you're subscribed there as well. Great opportunity for you to uh, not only make sure you're getting all the notifications when we are live, but of course, giving you the access to our full archives, which continue to grow every single day. So with that, let's remind you that our discussion still is exclusively informational and educational. Remember, we are not in the business of making recommendations. Any expression of opinion is always subject to change without notice. We talk a lot about technical analysis here, uh, the, the uh, concepts that are uh, employed by some traders, uh, some of the tenets of technical analysis. But remember to consider technical analysis simply a complement to your broader fundamental research, everybody. We don't want to rely exclusively on that. Uh, for decision making. And then uh, today we might actually get to a discussion on options. I'll just point out that options are not appropriate for all investors. Make sure you're familiar with the characteristics and risks of standardized options before investing in options, of course. And we get started with a broad market review, which we'll do again today. We've got a couple of notable sections in the market that are um, Pretty intriguing of late. We'll take a look at oil and energy, which has just been continuing to push. And uh, then we're going to make some time today to get to our example portfolio where we house about five or six positions. And we're going to look at adjustments that might need to be made uh, along the way there in our uh, existing trade. So we'll take a look at all of that with all of you today. Let's get right to it. Brent, I'm going to bring up the SPX here on our uh, desktop platform for Think or Swim. And I think one thing that's uh, immediately noted, Brent, is yesterday didn't feel very good. And yet that candle we had at the finish might be a little bit of a heads up that might be more of the same even still. <laughs> yes, indeed. Look, we've had a pullback the last uh, last last couple of days. But uh, yesterday, hey, we were we held ground. And it, what's key is. We held where we held ground. We held ground right at that 20 day moving average there, Kevin. So, uh, and as we look back, as we've talked about quite a bit over the weeks, uh, that 20 day, 20 day moving average seems to be a pretty key support level. And so, th despite the pullback we've had, the trend, I think you'd have to say the trend is intact. It doesn't mean trends are going to last forever, but as of yet, I don't see a break in that trend. Yeah, no matter how maybe negative you felt at the open yesterday uh the the bounce it was pretty clear at least based on that nice tail and i'll zoom in just a little more so we can talk yeah. about that tail here everybody brent there's plenty of implications that a trader in the shorter run would take from that tail can you kind of speak to what that might imply uh, just on a very short-term basis here the way that we we basically opened um and and we traded down for about yeah. 15 to 20 minutes and then it was hey we found a level of uh, that interested buyers and they stepped right in uh yeah absolutely now the 
when, when you're looking at a candle, I mean, I think the, the, the most e the easiest thing, you, first thing you may notice on a candle is green or red. And of course you can say, well, green seems more bullish, red seems more bearish, but it's, there's certainly more to that. One of the things that traders look at is where did the stock end up in relationship to the day? And if, it, if the stock or index or whatever you're looking at closes at the bottom of the trading range of the day, generally that is a, a, a kind of a bad sign in terms of, in terms of uh, what, a, a bad omen for the next day. Not a guarantee, but it's, it, it's not a sign of strength going into the next day. Well, if we take yesterday's candle, the low of the day, we were right near that 20 day, which we've mentioned, but by the time all was said and done, we ended up closing near the high of the day, which is generally a, a strong way to end the day. And what the way you end the day is often how you start the next day. And so that's what we have today. I mean, we, we it does appear that, uh, you know, even though we opened up down just a smidge this morning, uh, we have a green candle this morning. And so that was a good sign, a strong sign that we may be bouncing off support here. Yeah, it may very well be the case. Uh, for a lot of you uh, trend traders, one of those potential uh, scenarios that could play out today is pushing through yesterday's high. Uh, if, you know, a couple of things of note for, for many of you, we had this little, uh, you know, ascending triangle through here for about a week and a half, and that put us a ledge at around 5,185 or so. And then we had that beautiful green candle there on March 20. That was our breakout day. And so we pushed to new period highs, uh, new all-time highs, as it were, close to 5,265. And of course, it's just been a little bit of a breather. So a little rangy over the last two weeks. Weeks, but not surprised at all to find that level at around 5185 to 5200 providing some short-term support and now i'm sure there are short-term traders wondering hey can we get through yesterday's high because of course brent anytime we have the opportunity to trade through the high of the low day in our pullback it can frequently be that first aggressive entry for a trend trader who says all right we are right back on pattern here and some trend or trend traders would say even though they might be aggressively ag acting aggressively in doing so by buying into an intraday move for example their expectation could be hey if we trade through yesterday's high we have a chance to go right back to where we were those prior highs from the last two weeks yeah and one advantage of of trading now and I don't know whether the market's going up or down from here but when you do enter a trade and the stock is near a support level and here we kind of have approached a support level from a couple ways the both the moving average and that horizontal support have converged there but when you're getting in closer to the support support level it means typically you could place a stop level closer to your entry point, which can help with the risk reward ratio regarding your trade. And so that's mm -hmm. an advantage. Of course, stops don't guarantee you're going to get out, but it is nice to be able to place that stop a little tighter when you're considering those risk reward ratios. Yeah, you're not going to get an argument from me on that one, Brent. I'm a big believer in yes. employing at least the concept of risk versus reward, consistency with uh, your opportunity for um, uh, profit versus the amount of risk you're willing to take on. If you could stick to that, that can be very helpful for the trader who is trading quite kind of actively. Uh, so let's take a quick second to um, address some of these things here in the queue. I should note, uh, I did not highlight the coaching page. So let me bring that up here for you all. Here is the coaching page, everybody. You can do a quick YouTube search for this or Google search for this as well. Uh, take your preferences to your search engine. But um, you're just looking for Schwab coaching. Uh, that'll pop up to this page. You can subscribe right here. Uh, and here down below, everybody, is where we have a house the archives, if you will. We've got the schedule of upcoming live streams. And then you've got your individual playlists noted below. Some of you are familiarizing yourselves with our Thinkorswim desktop application. You might want to start there directly with Cam and his Get Started with Thinkorswim. Great 
discussion there. Uh, and of course, we've got one that is for you transitioners from the use of Street Smart Edge to our Think or Swim desktop platform, as well as Think or Swim uh, web applications. I know Brent has been doing quite a bit there as it relates to uh, Think or Swim web as well. So there's a lot of opportunity here for you, everybody. But ultimately, uh, I think if you're unable to attend any of the live sessions, just recognize that the majority, the vast majority of our sessions here are archived and available for your use at your discretion, everybody. So do check out the page here, like and subscribe, make sure you're accessing it. It's a good one to bookmark, Brent. We certainly got a lot out there. Yeah, absolutely. And one other thing I would point out, I, I, often in terms of navigation, at the top of the page, there's a link for playlists there. Now, it already Kevin already showed you, you can actually get playlists if, as you scroll down. But if you want the playlist kind of organized in a different way, maybe you like it better this way or not. But if you click on playlists, it'll just kind of have one one, uh, I don't know, headshot, one, what do you call it, a thumbnail for each playlist there, if that's easier for you to view on right there. And then underneath each of those, it says view full playlist. So you yep. can see in the kind of the bottom left, you see Trader Talk in today's market. If you want to see the playlist for that, you would just click on view full playlist and so on down the list. You'll also see, hey, there's a different... Uh, Different coaches out there, you can see Ben Watson and, and take advantage of his classes as well, or Kevin, et, et cetera, there. So it just, play around with the page would be my take. Absolutely, there's uh, plenty to learn from here on the uh, on the channel, no doubt. So, all right, let's take it back to um, you know conversation of what's going on here. We'll bring up the Nasdaq, which did have a little bit of a rougher day yesterday. Uh, we had that close below the 20, and yet not every trader is terribly concerned about that, Brent, by the looks of things here. No, I, I I would I would agree with that, and uh, you know we're the, the twenty day has been violated more. In fact, you have it highlighted there on the on the chart. It's been violated more than the twenty day was on the SPX. SPX mm -hmm. it hardly has been for the last few months. Nasdaq, yeah, it seems more comfortable with that. And in fact, that fifty day may be more relevant there on the uh, on the Nasdaq or maybe even a 30 day, I'm not sure, but you can see the trend line on the graph. That seems to be where we're at. Now, of course, if we start breaking below lower lows, b b below previous lows, then that be, is, is gonna be more of a concern, but really this is pretty much uh, mirroring the S&P 500 in terms of general trend, if, mm -hmm. if not the exact, you know, keep it holding to the exact same moving average. But the yeah. same thing yesterday, if you in terms of where we ended up, uh, mm -hmm. we ended up right at the close, you know, right at near the high yesterday. In fact, there was a question in the chat on what about the uh, huge volume spike yesterday on the, this near on some of these indexes near the close. Well, yeah. look, w when you get a rally, in fact, maybe you can go to a one day, one minute chart here, Kevin, real quick sure. uh, and just look minutes, at that work or five minute works. Look at sure. where we ended up yesterday. And, and so you can see, just to orient yourself, the, the kind of the lighter, gr the grayish areas it, are the after hours. Yeah. And uh, so you can see in the time period preceding, like the half hour or so before the yesterday's close, look at the big run up in the index there on that. And whenever you see those big big moves at the close, and, and typically at the close, you tend to get a volume spike in, in, in itself anyways. I, I would say that's probably the largest uh, the largest factor that when you get big moves in the market, you tend to see bigger volumes, whether those moves are to the upside or to the downside. Yeah, the other uh, the other thing is always be thoughtful of of maybe why are we getting that? OK, uh, some traders might have looked at this and said, hey, we had a big move lower from the prior day in the NDX and we were really range bound for the majority of the day. And then all of a sudden we got to a point in that final 30 minutes, as you said, final 30 to 45, where we traded to a point that was the highest of the day. And some traders might have used that and said, OK, that's the extent of today's action for me as a short-term trader. So if they were, for example, bearish on the day, they may have been utilizing that final 30 to 45 minutes of the day to cover bearish trades. And commonly, that implies a need to be buying the market back, right? So if you think about it from the standpoint of somebody uh, maybe borrowing stock from their broker to short in the open market, they'd have to buy those shares back to cover that short. 
that provides lift because by buying stock, that raises prices, right? Regardless of yep. which side of the trade you were on. Yep. Are you opening a trade? Are you closing a trade? So there's there's always a, uh, a process for consideration. And that would be my encouragement is to give thought to that uh, always. So with that in mind, Brent, let's kick it on over to the Russell here. I'm going to bring back uh, our daily. Here we go. What are your thoughts? Thoughts are we we still have a trend that's been going up a little bit more of a pullback on this one, but uh, you know we've had a series of higher highs, higher lows. You could still draw a trend line on this one here, and uh, you know th this is going to come into as we talk about this. We, the Russell has struggled. It's had some bigger pullbacks than a lot of the market. And some of that may be a little bit more interest rate sensitive as well. They, Russell tends to be more interest rate sensitive than these others. And uh, more concerns about debt levels, for example, in these couple in these companies that make up these small cap companies that make the Russell. But talking about the Russell itself, uh, you know, I, I have no reason to say that the trend is not uh, is is not there. Just kind of some bigger swings in that trend right now, I would say. But and in the, in the case of the Russell, as opposed to the the S and P five hundred, where we were, you know, focusing in on that twenty day moving average. Look at that fifty day moving average on the Russell. That seems to be the key, kind of a, a more key level on, on that. Yeah, I think I agree with you, Brent. If I was to quickly remove the 20 day, it'll look a little more clear for us here. Yeah. And you can see that those higher lows still holding. So, yeah, we agree. Uh, a bit of a pullback here. This is likely tied, Brent, many would say. And we did look at this just yesterday uh, tied to that 10 year move. Let's take a peek yeah. at the TNX here real quick. Pull up the uh, there we are. And yeah, we had that gap yesterday and that kind of seemed to put a little bit of a headwind into the Russell and now it's further gapped. So we've got a continuation move today, Brent. And if this continues, yeah, this could be the problem of another headwind that the market needs to be paying close attention to. Yeah, that's that's the issue. I mean, when we're talking about the, this interest rate, the, the, the challenge, the 10 year rate, what, one of the challenges is, and to just kind of going out to the macro perspective here for a sec, we're, we, what we have is we have some kind of sticky, stronger inflation data, and but fairly strong economic data for the most part. And that combination here leads investors to believe, well, the Fed's not going to be too, uh, too quick to, to lower, to, to, to loosen here. And mm -hmm. so, um, and and given that, what uh, what what the reaction to that is is that the TNX uh, remains elevated, and the consequence of the TNX remaining elevated, it can affect the rest of the market. One of those areas of the markets that it can affect is small caps, probably disproportionately to some of those others. And so you yes. have kind of an inverse, uh, inverse, probably this inverse correlation between the TNX and what the rut, rut is doing right now. Yeah, I, I have to agree, unfortunately, that, um, yeah, there, there's definitely that clear relationship. It, it requires us to at least keep a monitor on it. Uh, as, as frequent viewers of the show know, we talk about that, uh, the CME Fed tool, just as a means of keeping an eye on how traders are positioning themselves for coming um, FOMC decisions. Still looks like there's a belief we could be getting cuts in June, Brent, but those uh, beliefs are waning. Just a week ago, we were near 64% for a Fed cut of 25 points. Today, that's around 51%. And that's d directly data dependent, Brent, uh, because we continue to see inflation be a little bit stickier than the Fed wants to yeah. see. I think the thought process might very well be, hey, can the Fed afford to cut rates or does the Fed really need to lean into the idea of higher for longer? Yeah. And as you mentioned, you mentioned the data dependent uh, thing there, Kevin. And uh, it's true. Remember, we started the year off with what was our latter part of last year. We were talking about six potential rate cuts for the year, I think it, it was. Yep. Well, I think we've cut that in half at this point and that could further change. Yeah, it really could. Okay, Brent, let's kick it over to another big mover we've witnessed of late. How about the move in oil? 
Um, okay. Take a look at crude here. We have been monitoring crude for a while. We talked way back in the in December and January about the ascending triangle. Now we've broken that, and we've had a bull flag break and another uh, break to the upside, Brent. I'm sure some traders out here now, given the level to which we've risen, around 85, 86 a barrel, might be expecting to find something or are looking for something akin to this right yeah. here once more. Well, when you get a big strong move in a stock or a commodity or pretty much anything, a lot of times you get a little breather along the way. And that's uh, that breather we often call a flag pattern. But uh, it is uh, not not surprising when you see that just because, you know, things only run so far so so quick. But it, even though if it does that, it doesn't change the general trend. And, you know, the question right now is, but boy, I mean, you know, at, at the rate we're going, we're going to be at 90 before too long on, on mm -hmm. oil. So, you know, I don't know. It, it could certainly turn around and it's susceptible to uh, geopolitical events. Remember, when anytime, anytime we talk about oil, there's the supply side and there's the demand side and they both can affect oil right now. Uh, you know, there's some of it is worldwide de demand and expectation of demand is increasing, and therefore that is uh, helping to drive oil up. And uh, you know, it. I, I sometimes there's other events we we can see certainly something in the Middle East. Uh, it's the oil's been relatively resilient in terms of not spiking when the uh, the Israel Gaza war situation, but it, it you know th th those kind of factors can certainly uh, play and 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 affect the 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 uh, course of oil here as we look forward into this too. They absolutely can, and of course, many would suggest that a move in oil like we've gotten has been probably. Uh, the, the biggest reason we've seen the energy space moving the way that it has, Brent. Yes. I've got a lot of lines drawn in here. Um, the first one is my vertical line here. This is the height of the range that we just broke out of back in uh, the beginning of March. And we've already achieved that. And then, Brent, we have just, uh, with today's move, taken the energy se sector to, if I'm not mistaken, these are levels, uh, all-time highs. Yeah, in, uh, energy's been crazy. Uh, energy's been the, the strongest sector, U.S. sector, over the last month. In fact, it's been up about twice as much as the ne next closest sector, which has been good. Communications has done very well. Materials has done fairly well. But energy has been the clear, clear mover. And we broke right through some potential resistance levels that we were looking looking at on that. And it looks like we're right at another one. But uh, that that strength is still there, and and even if we pause at the uh, even if we pause, it doesn't mean that the the run isn't over. Again, it could just be kind of it's a true. flag that we're looking at. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways that this can play out. You know, traders that stepped in on the trend line here back in the beginning or the end of January, early February, could surely be using this push that we've had to this ledge as a means of maybe taking a little profit off the table, reducing risk. Yes. Uh, but ultimately, it's a great move you've seen in oil and energy broadly, as you stated. We don't know if a breakout's coming. A, a pause, at least at this level, makes sense. Um, what we need to pay attention to is, is our own individual positions and how comfortable we are with where we reside and the recognition we could get thrown back from this level just based on having met resistance, bro. And and looking at the chart, looking back at the last two three years, is kind of this longer term uh, ascending triangle uh, pattern that we have. You have the horizontal resistance level. We had the uh, support level that's trending up on this, mm -hmm. and uh, we broke through that. And that's not the that's that's kind of the expected outcome on a pattern like that. And in this case, it kind of came to fruition. Yep. So we'll see what happens on energy there. That's a notable move for sure. Uh, we've seen a bunch of strength as well, uh, Brent, out of materials, which is interesting to a lot of traders uh, because, you know, you've seen moves in some of those precious metals have been kind of a safe haven seemingly yeah. of late. There's been some concerns about uh, the um, uh, the overall rate environment. And I've noted, at least lately, we've seen materials continuing this trend. I'm going to put this 20-day uh, moving average back in, and you'll see we're well above the 20-day, Brent. Material sector continues to do quite well since breaking out 
out of uh, that resistance zone back in uh, the beginning, middle of February, really. Yeah, absolutely. And and so that's, uh, you, as you mentioned, uh, you know, in, as we, we look at individual components, things like precious metals, you'll see that uh, that those have really taken off. And sometimes these can be a little bit uh, of a, well, there, there's d different approaches in the market. And if you're concerned about uh, stock valuations, sometimes people will move more towards like commodity type things. And we've seen that in, we saw that in oil and yep. you can see that in precious metals and the, those are commodities. And they, uh, what, one advantage of these, and it's not a sales pitch for commodities here or anything, because they can go up or down. But one, one thing with the commodity space is sometimes the correlations between commodities and the rest of the market tend to be a little bit lower than correlations between uh, a lot of the other sectors with each other. So it's a way of diversifying your portfolio a little bit, and uh, which a lot of traders like to do, uh, sure. so that if the market does drop, it doesn't, and, and just think about it, when the market drops and you look at your portfolio, how many of your stocks are dropping? Probably a high number. I know that's true. When I look at my portfolio on things, is there's pretty high correlations on a lot of stocks across across the board. By trying to lower correlations, you, it's a, an attempt to try to lower the standard deviations or lower the risk in your portfolio. That's one thing that attracts a lot of people to that space. I really like that point, Brent. Uh, it's a great reminder. Yes, this is trader talk, but there's by no means a requirement to stick to the trading aspect. Yes, some traders will follow a properly distributed investment dollar, meaning they might invest portions of their dollars in you know, five, six, seven different sectors so that any given day of the week, they can have a decent day. And if the market is just undergoing ro traditional rotation or normal movement out of one area to another, they're probably doing just fine. Uh, but it's the point is well made because uh, those of you who are investors in the long haul, you're likely mitigating risk, not through the use of downside protective orders and that kind of thing, but through that um, that uh, uh, distribution of how that money is uh, deployed in the marketplace, right? Diversified and allocated to all 11 sectors in the market, all cap weighted sizes, et cetera. It's super important to have that. Uh, so a lot of traders will take a, a chunk, a small portion, mind you, for something like gold, which as we can yeah. see has rallied out of a bull flag. And we're gonna look at silver here real quickly. And I think we're gonna see something similar. There's that bull flag. I mean, this has been, I mean, these flags, Brent, aren't even giving back. I mean, these are like flags in a stiff wind to the upside. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. And so this is similar to when we were talking about uh, oil earlier. It's It's gone up. Wouldn't it be surprising to see a pause or a flag in this? But by no means does that mean the trend is uh, necessarily over. That's the truth. Uh, so bears watching, I thought uh, the notable pattern as it relates to silver was maybe that weekly chart. You'll see everybody, silver, that's the highest we've seen the silver contracts uh, going back into March of last year. So, hey, keep an eye on, on maybe on that because that appears that it could be breaking higher. And as a reminder, again, you know, these are these are just things that are happening. These are not encouragements for you to to be trading on these necessarily. But I, I think it certainly bears watching as we are at a very important level here historically on uh, on silver and gold, both. So uh, keep an eye on all of that. Uh, all right, Brent, uh, let's see where we sit. All right. So we've taken a look at a number of our individual sectors. Brent, uh, when you're looking over here at, at what's going on on a sector relationship basis today, is there another one that's kind of jumping off the screen for you? Anything else you want to maybe hit on today? Well, let, let me just mention general trends in the sectors. We've already hit on energy and materials, um, but there's some that have been laggers. Real estate it has sure. been a laggard. Uh, cons consumer uh, discretionary has been a lagger too. You see, I mean, look at the trend on that real estate versus the trends we've just been looking at there. That's yeah. been just going flat. Uh, you'd see, uh, I think, something fairly similar. Uh, disc discretionary has done a little bit better, but it's uh, it's certainly nothing. Not looking like uh, you know energy or materials 
or mm -hmm. even utilities has been pretty strong. Financials has been pretty strong. So you can kind of look across the across the board on these on these things. It, yeah, the utilities move is a little bit intriguing to me, but simply because um, you would have thought that with the concept of higher rates, that utilities should not be breaking out. But that's what we got here in the last week. Now, granted, today it's pulling back, but that could just be tied to the the ten year rallying a little bit, perhaps. Uh, the the significance is maybe a little notable on utilities, but Brent, it's not a wonderful market, broadly speaking, when the utilities group is a leader suddenly. So could we be witnessing a little transitional movement of assets out of growth and maybe into a little more stability? Well, that's that's something we've seen in the sense of if you look at the technology sector, the technology sector isn't, I wouldn't say it's doing poorly by any means, but the tech, how long was IT a leader in the market, Kevin? And <laughs> now, and, and, and so people were saying, well, this is kind of an unhealthy market when IT is just taking, is just leading and, and nothing else is, everything else is kind of just blah. But, uh, but we've actually seen this change here where some other things are picking up. Now, to your point on utilities, utilities is generally considered to be more of a defensive sector. In other words, one that people go to when they're a little bit more worried with the market, when the market's not doing as well. So from that standpoint, yeah, it's not the greatest sign, but I, I do like and welcome a, a broader based market than just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, five stocks of the Magnificent Seven doing well, or, you know, we, the, a little more breadth in the market is a good thing. Well, and that's exactly why I threw up the equal weighted uh, S&P 500 view. We had a request to kind of peek in on this in the SPX. And I think this might give uh, investors just a little bit of a, an understanding of the importance of that trend, Brent. We've maintained the 20 day here back to January as yeah. well. And so while you've heard a lot of discussion about the Magnificent Seven, a couple of things are notable. Um, equal weighted index, uh, the S&P 500 continues to do very well. We're just finding support along the 20 day. And then there's a couple of big names within those leaders, those magnificent groups, those, that big seven, Tesla in particular, and um, Apple as well, that yes. are both really underperforming, Brent. And I think that that's notable because if we've got the S&P 500 trading it within 1% of highs, all time highs, mind you, and we've got two of the biggest companies in our country and in the world in reality, getting beaten up or trading in lows, having a really rough year-to-date return, two things could be happening. One, we could just be witnessing um, you know, an opportunity here for those large stocks, the Apples and the Teslas of the world, to maybe find support and could then carry us further. If we can rally off of these, Brent, some would suggest that there's an opportunity here in the yep. SPX even further just by virtue of these two stocks having an opportunity to continue to move or to pull up, push off of uh, short-term support. But by the same token, Brent, these are levels that if not held could be problematic, not just for the them themselves, but for the broader market as well. Yeah, it could go either way. And on, on Apple, it seems like we're kind of near the kind of a key level. They are uh, yeah. what October, uh, October support level. Uh, you know, we're not too far from breaking below that. And uh, so we'll have to see on that. And that can certainly, uh, you know, that that's, that's kind of a uh, headwind on the market there as a whole. The market's been holding up pretty well, but if the rest of the market uh, loses, you know, loses some of that strength, then and these continue down with the, with just the size of the market caps that they are. I mean, Apple mm -hmm. isn't the largest company in the world by market cap anymore, but it's right up there, um, and uh, that. That certainly affects things like the S and P five hundred. It's it's uh, so so th th these certainly can can drag the market. But it is good to, to your prior point. It is good mm -hmm. to see that the S and P equal weight, the S and P five hundred as a whole, in in fact, is uh, is still performing well despite the fact that Apple and Tesla have pulled down. And that was, I think, a concern with people when the market was very strong was if some of these big cap stocks, big cap names pull back strongly, is that just going to, you know, is that going to just change the whole tenor of the market? And fortunately, it hasn't. The market has remained strong in that regard.
So, Brent, we've had a shift in things uh, happening as we have been discussing here. Everything shifted to green. Let me t take a look at why and pull up the SPX here for you, everybody. So we bounced. We got through that high from yesterday. So we are looking at the very aggressive potential intraday entry for uh, bulls thinking we are through the high of yesterday, the so-called hold. Huge spike here at the 8 o'clock or 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern uh, time frame. This is tied to that jobs report. Private payrolls increasing by 184,000 in March, which was better than expected according to ADP. So adding 184,000 versus a, an upwardly already upwardly revised February gain that was 155,000 jobs. So uh, strong employment pickup. Uh, wages for workers who stayed in their jobs have increased by five, more than 5% from a year ago. These are positives as it relates to the economy. And, of course, the market likes to see that strength. But uh, by the same token, that strength yeah. in the market can lead to, unfortunately, a little bit of a continuation of what we've been seeing in the way of prices. So it's a double-edged sword, but Brent, it would appear that that jobs report led to a, the spike we got here most recently and everything. Yeah, I think so. You know, sometimes good news is good news, and sometimes good news is bad news for the market. <laughs> in, in a sense. And this time, good news is good news. And what I mean by that is sometimes you get these positive economic reports, and instead of getting the market reaction going up, the market reaction goes down because the fear is, ooh, with the strong labor market, strong wage growth, that's going to lead the Fed, it brings it back to the Fed, it's going to lead the Fed to keep interest rates higher, longer, and that mm -hmm. could potentially, that affects people's outlooks on the market, and therefore, uh, they worry about the future of the market. But in this case, uh, you know, there people are taking that for, you know, good news in, in terms of jobs in the market. We want people to have jobs. Uh, sure. And the market's taking that in a, in a positive manner right now. Sure is. Um, and, and this is my hourly bars, everybody, on the S&P 500. So, you know, we are into this gap zone now. Maybe some traders are going to see if we can continue the candle and push ourselves right back into the highs. Needless, I hope it's needless to say, Brent, for those of you traders out there. But maybe if we get ourselves right back to 52.65, we've got yet again another discussion. Do we meet resistance? Do we finally break through it? Um, what ha I mean, that's assuming we even get there. There's no guarantee that that happens. So uh, it's been a good reaction to the number, that, at least to this point. But um, we'll take that with uh, a little grain of salt simply because we're middle of the market day. Or we're only in the first 40 minutes of the day, so we can't go too far. Yep. And, and as we've seen very often how the market starts, it doesn't end that way. In fact, we were talking about that earlier on the day, just uh, yep. what was that yesterday, I guess, where we ended right near the, the high, of the, high of the day after not a very good day. Yep. So, um, OK, so we've got um, a nice little flip. We should be pleased with that. We'll take it. Uh, everybody, I wanted to hit up our example monitored for portfolio here for a quick look at some details. Uh, you know, everything is protected. We've got uh, positions across the board here with sell orders incorporated to reduce the, the risk we have. Um, you know, the stop orders, just as a reminder for those of you who are a little unfamiliar, you know, you, you employ those as a means of reducing risk, but they don't guarantee that your risk is reduced to a specific amount because, of course, once they trigger, market orders become, or excuse me, trigger, they become, stop orders become market orders, which we do not have a a, um, a way to validate that price. So price can be executed at any level. So just keep that in mind. Um, we have a few positions that are working, though. We've got that Disney trade, which continues to do well. We're up 30 plus percent. Slumberger, we've got a uh, broke uh, a split trade here, Brent. We have a call written against the uh, 100 of our 300 shares. So we wrote one call option, just trying to get paid to be a seller of a stock that, and has done well for us. We're up collectively almost 14 percent. And so our discussion here a couple, about a week ago was, hey, can we sell a call, enter into a contract by which uh, the other end of our contract was wants to take our stock from us at the strike price, $55. Stock is trading now at 48, pardon me, 54.70, excuse me, we're in at 48. And so we know that if we got taken out on that contract, if we get assigned, we'd be profitable, which is really what we're striving for with that uh, sell to open strategy. And then we've got a protective order beneath it on Slumberger. So we are, yeah. we're not protecting the 100, but we're protecting the 200 there. So let me get that symbol in. There you go. 
And boy, Brent, look at that tail we got just yesterday on it and how um, <laughs> yeah, the, I didn't know. Aver- the use of the average true range, which is what was incorporated in our decision on the 200 share stop level, really became helpful for us. That it, it, Indeed, it did. And that, that illustrates one of, you know, stops can be great. They can also be tough sometimes. And and one of the things that happens if you do stops enough, what you'll see is the stock will come down, barely hit your stop. And then, of course, the traditional market order, you end up selling your stock and then it pops way back up and you're like, oh, I put it too tight. Well, we cut it a little close there on that one there, but did not quite. And it, it was just fine. We, we went yep. down low, it, it bounced back up, it reversed. And so uh, the stop levels does seem to be uh, appropriate there. And I, I really like this trade in the sense that it illustrates how different approaches you can do. And, and by putting a short call against 100 shares of the yep. stock, not full 300, it just shows another approach to money management, risk management that you can do here. Uh, you don't have to always, uh, you don't always have to do a cover call on all X number of shares that, that you mm-hmm. have uh, there. And so I, I, th- I think that's a good illustration you've done. I, I liked it. I, mean, I, I was enjoying the discussion around that when we I spoke about it last week. And I thought that was just a really just a fun discussion, just because, like you said, there's a lot of ways to trade the market. There are a lot of ways to consider exiting positions, especially in position of profit. And by no means, I mean, if you're if you're sitting on multiple lots, that's exactly what this discussion was designed to kind of highlight here, the opportunity to spread things a little bit. And if you're if you're a fan of piecing into your trades and piecing out of your trades, especially with shares that allow you to own lots, uh, multiple lots, you know, 100 share lots, that gives you that opportunity to consider options. So uh, that's how we ended up there. Um, The other big movers percentage wise, let's take a look at Visa here. Visa is doing pretty well. I'm going to click that five, which is going to link it to my chart automatically. Boy, we are sitting right on that 50-day moving average. It's a little precarious, Brent, but I think the reminder we offer today might be, hey, we don't change horses midstream. We've got our stop order down there. We might be at risk of being stopped out, Brent. But at the same time, we're not making an adjustment to that existing stop. Yeah, and the stop's not that far from where we're at. And so uh, we're giving it an ample chance to to reform itself, so to speak, and and jump up. But... uh, but uh, if it's not going to go down to that stop, we put the stop where we did for a particular reason. And uh, the, I, I see no problem holding holding on to that stop right where it is. In fact, there's a question in the chat I'd like to address real yeah. quick here, Kevin. Please. That is, uh, when you use the 20-day moving average, what time frame are you using? Uh, look, right right now we have a, a one-year chart uh, that you a little zoomed in on, it looks like maybe. But it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't really matter to a certain extent. The 20 day is the 20 day moving average. Uh, sometimes you can zoom in to see it a little more clear. Um, if you're using one month, often I'll use a nine month or six month graph. To, it's kind of a balance between you know, getting the perspective of, and seeing where support levels are, but also yeah. zooming in enough that you can see it. You can go shorter term. Um, now, you do need to be cautious. If you switch to just a five year chart, often, it will switch to a five-year weekly chart. And like (laughs) there's the max weekly chart. And that is no longer a 20-day moving average. That is now a 20-week moving average. That week at the upper left tells you that. So just be aware of that. But doesn't really necessarily matter. Whatever you like, whether you want to use three months, six months, nine months, a year, uh, Eddie, I think that's no problem. I, I tend to lean into the same thought, Brent. Uh, a lot of traders like to get started maybe by just sticking to some consistent moving averages that a lot of other traders rely on. So that's where the consistency of use of something like the 20, the 50, and the 200, which is what we you know generally look at. And you, many of you viewers who are here frequently, you see us make alterations to this all the time. We Sometimes we look at the 10-day because the pattern is running quickly, there's a lot of momentum, uh, or we're pulling back to a moving average we haven't seen in a long time. Maybe it needs to be the 100 days sometimes. So um, time frame wise, yeah, some traders think about it from that, uh, oh, I'm in that four to six week swing trade window. Commonly, traders will look at the 20 day for that. Some lean into the 30. And yet, some traders just say, you know what, time frame isn't as important from a standpoint of how long I'm going to hold something. 
What is important is how long does the stock trade above the moving average that matters to me? And some traders will just kind of take that approach. So um, there's a lot of ways to go about trading the market, Brent. But I think one of the reminders we'll wrap with today is that uh, consistency in a process for trading is as important as anything else. Do you agree with that that sentiment? Uh, I I can <laughs> I I have to agree with that statement, Kevin. We've <laughs> talked about this a lot. Consi I I don't have the magic formula for you guys out there trading. Um, I don't think there is a magic formula, but what you need to do is you need to be consistent. And if you're consistent and things are going great, great. You know what you've been doing. And uh, if you're consistent and things aren't going great, then maybe you can look to make some changes. But if you're inconsistent and things are going well, well, you've been inconsistent, it's not repeatable. And uh, so you don't, you know, you just don't know what to change if things aren't going. So consistency is the key there. It, it's not everything, but it's a, a large part of the formula here. So be, be consistent, everybody. And a lot well of that said. goes back to a trading plan helps. Yep. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Very well stated. Consistency and, of course, the discipline to stick to that consistency, yep. which is as hard as anything else. Yeah. Um, Bob is asking, um, am, am I still a proponent of basing stop levels on closing end of day prices? As much as you can, yes. Uh, but that's because, you know, traders tend to lean into closing values more importantly than, say, uh, intraday fluctuations. That's why we use things like candlesticks, which tell us, hey, we've had fluctuations below the close, above the uh, above the open, et cetera. It gives us a better understanding of where maybe those levels reside. But uh, in terms of um, you know, decisioning based on, hey, we took out a certain level, a lot of traders will lean into the closing values in lieu of intraday values uh, in that way. So maybe um, putting a little lean into that might be appropriate. So everybody, we're going to wrap it there. It has been a lively discussion, largely due to what's happened in the market during our chat today, which I always love, Brent, getting market movement in the middle of our discussion. Uh, that makes it fun. So Brent, thanks for being here, of course, and thanks for sharing your insights with everybody. Thanks for having me on today, Kevin. And uh, I know you're in, in on in what, what you're about to go on a, a little break <laughs> here, and so uh, I a hope little. you enjoy that. I don't think I'll be on with you again before your break, so we hope you enjoy that. And everybody, Thank have you, a sir. wonderful day. I agree, and everybody, thanks for being here. Follow us on X, like and subscribe to that channel. Everybody, have a great rest of your day. We will see you again real soon.